Well, well, okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and welcome to the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub. This is our 33rd webinar and we're really grateful to the Mindaroo Foundation, which is a large Australian foundation that focuses on AI and other frontier technologies. And so we are grateful to have today one of the world's foremost experts on AI and on AI in China in specific, Jeffrey Ding. He is an assistant professor at GWU and we are so lucky to have him. Um, before I officially begin, I wanna also thank our sponsors at GW in Brazil, um, FGV, in Canada, CG. And thank you for joining us, Jeff, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aronson, for this opportunity and really excited to also hear more um, about your work and the work that um, the Data Governments Hub is doing in terms of bringing these events together and uh, their publications as well. So let me share my screen and see if people can see my PowerPoint. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to only present for 10 to 15 minutes max on US-China competition in AI, how to assess um, China's AI capabilities. And I think I'm going to present a slightly different take from the ones you usually hear. So um, some might even call it a hot take, but um, we'll, we'll see how, um, how the, the temperature of the take and we'll, we'll see how it turns out. So let me start with this motivation of a simple question, what are we competing over? Um, if we go back to President Joe Biden's first address to the US Congress, I think it presents a good picture of what the conventional view, um, definitely in this city that, that we're both currently in, is in terms of what we're competing with China um, over uh, when it comes to emerging technologies. Biden's remarks emphasize the need to develop breakthroughs in new technologies and dominate the innovation of these new emerging technologies. And according to Biden, the US was, quote, falling behind in that competition. China and other countries are closing in fast. I think this, this first address, the quotes that I'm highlighting here, the, the framework that Biden is expressing has remained pretty consistent over the past uh, couple of years in terms of how the current US administration and I think the current um, conventional wisdom in DC views US-China competition. And the two themes I wanna highlight are the current administration's overwhelming preoccupation with which state first generates novel advances. And I'll use the term innovation capacity to describe this. Second theme that comes across in that speech is the belief that China is close to overtaking the US. Uh, and I would say a lot of decision makers in uh, countries, not just the US, you know, a lot of the ones that Susan mentioned, countries with institutions that are sponsoring this talk, Canada, Australia, have also expressed views that China is close to overtaking the US in science and technology capabilities, especially with respect to emerging technologies like AI. One thing I want to note here, I think it's interesting, is, is the first point shapes the second. If you believe that scientific and technological competition is about which state first generates new advances, if you believe innovation capacity is central to this, uh, maybe you would be more likely to believe that China is close to overtaking the U.S. Um, I'll show you a few indicators later, but in terms of R&D spending that China is investing, um, high profile Chinese technology companies at the frontier, the Baidu's, Alibaba's of the world, um, investments in top research universities and how much those universities are spending on R&D. There are a lot of indicators that show China's quickly catching up in terms of innovation capacity. I'm gonna present a different view though, because I don't believe that the first point is true. And I believe we should pay greater attention to a country's diffusion capacity, its ability to spread and adopt innovations after their initial inception across productive processes. 
And this is drawing from a forthcoming paper in the Review of International Political Economy, where I introduced this idea of a diffusion deficit. So I think this, this need to pay more attention to diffusion capacity is really important, especially for technologies like AI, which are general purpose technologies that can have pervasive applications throughout the economy. Other general purpose technologies include electricity, um, the computer. It wasn't really that important which country was the first to uh, pioneer the electric dynamo. It was really important which country was better at electrifying their entire economy at scale. It wasn't that important which country was the first to produce the first computer. It was really important which country was able to computerize their economy at scale. And so one, cat, one, one procedural note I'll say is when I talk about science and technology competition, there's a lot of different things. Uh, there's a lot of different endpoints that, for why people would care about being ahead in science and technology. Uh, first, to be able to produce new military systems, soft power, prestige, there's, there's sort of those angles as well, controlling key nodes in the economy to impose sanctions. Um, the 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 endpoint that I really care about and that's that I'm operating under is uh, adapting quickly to new science and technology advances improves economic productivity, allows a country to sustain its rise and become the world's most productive economy. Historically, that has been the mechanism that has been the most central to the rise and fall of great powers. Um, so I think those other considerations are important. Um, this that specific channel, science and technology to sustaining rise in the long term by um, improving and boosting productivity growth uh, is, is what I'm focused on. So what how do we measure China's diffusion deficit? And by diffusion deficit, I mean um, China performs much better on indicators of innovation capacity as compared to indicators of diffusion capacity. So here I, de I decompose different indicators included in the Global Innovation Index, which is an index that tries to assess different scientific and technological capabilities across different countries around the world. On the left side, you'll see indicators that are more tied to the innovation capacity component. So I'll highlight a few global R&D companies. That's an indicator that calculates your top three companies in terms of R&D spend and it averages them. QS University rankings is the same thing, your top three universities, and looks at how well they rank in terms of different measures of science and technology. Um, so all of those are more tied to the innovation capacity side. On the right side, you have indicators that are more tied to the diffusion capacity side. Um, to what extent are different businesses actually adopting information communications and technology, uh, information and communications technologies, ICT, ICT access, uh, what's the usage rate of different ICT technologies like cloud computing, um, industrial software of different kinds? Um, China ranks relatively low, at middling power in terms of those types of rankings that speak to diffusion capacity. To what extent are your universities tied to your industry so that ideas can spread across different institutions who are pioneering and adopting new advances? Right, that's the third indicator. To what extent are, is there collaboration, strong linkages between different um, institutions? And as you'll see in the last row, that shows the, the diffusion deficit. China performs, the average ranking globally is very high uh, in terms of innovation capacity, very close to the US on that metric. Um, average ranking on diffusion capacity indicator is very, very low. And this is adopted from that diffusion deficit paper. Let me conclude with one last point of how this plays out in AI. If we care about diffusion capacity, it might not be about the high-end AI experts, but more about just the average AI engineers, people implementing models um, in small and medium enterprises. So Tencent Research Institute and Boss Jiping, which is a job platform in China, uh, tried to compare the number of AI practitioners uh, in different key subdomains between the US and China. U.S. has overall more of those practitioners. And I would say for China, this presents a big challenge because if you care about diffusion, 
it's not just about your num the total number of engineers, it's about engineering density, how many engineers relative to your total population. So actually these numbers are inflated for China. If you controlled for density, it'd be even more of a gap in terms of total, uh, in terms of AI practice, pra AI engineering talent. Let me conclude with two more indicators of a diffusion deficit in AI. We care a lot about linkages between universities um, and industry, right? Because that's how ideas spread. We want a system where ideas spread very, um, in a very free flowing natural way. Uh, that sort of, those sort of co-authorship links are relatively weak in China in AI compared to the US. Stanford's uh, AI index calculated statistics on the number of hybrid AI publications, where you have at least one researcher from industry and one researcher from university contributing to that paper. Uh, US more than doubles China on that metric. Another indicator of the breadth of institutions to diffuse um, AI knowledge and research and AI training. Uh, I think one thing that I'm very, very interested in is uh, not necessarily your top universities, but how many universities you have that meet a certain quality baseline in terms of AI. And so one useful indicator would be at least one faculty member that has published at least one paper to an established AI conference. And then I count up the number of universities in each country that meet that standard. I think it's a useful quality baseline, pretty low quality baseline, but uh, the breadth of institutions that meet that baseline give you a good sense of uh, maybe diffusion capacity in AI. And if you looked at most recent metrics on this, this is pulled from CS rankings, US advantage in this area, 159 universities in the US that meet that baseline, 29 in China. So it, it, let me just conclude there. Um, what I've done today is kind of just give you an overview of how I think about science and techno technological competition between the US and China. If we do think about things in a competitive way, we, we should think about it more productively and more accurately. Um, and we should give greater weight to diffusion capacity. And if we look at diffusion capacity in AI, I've given you a couple of indicators of how I measure that and how I um, argue that actually um, China's pretty far behind the US uh, on this metric. I'm looking forward to the questions and discussion to follow. Happy to talk about anything related to this topic. I just thought I'd start us out with um, some insights from new research that's coming out. That's great. Um, okay, well, since you did that PowerPoint, I wanna challenge you on one thing. Uh, given that trust is so essential, and given that governments, the, many of the scandals that have erupted related to the use of AI relate to governments, but you didn't talk about the diffusion of a technology to governments, right? So I, just to repeat that triangle I'm trying to get at is if a government use, agency uses AI, it's sending a sort of seal of approval to it in a sense, whether that agency is... Um, you know, intelligence agency or whether it's using it to distribute healthcare benefits. Okay, so you didn't talk about that. And I think that would be key in China. Yeah, it's a great point to push back on, like government adoption of AI. I think that's one area where people would point to China being ahead. Um, I think for me, it's about, does, does that affect productivity? And I think there are some instances where government adoption of AI does affect productivity, uh, but China's main government adoption of AI right now is using facial recognition for surveillance purposes. I don't see that as providing this general productivity boost to the economy, like something like the electrification of different industries did, right? If anything, being able to precisely surveil different, a lot of people with facial recognition would depress overall. And trust, <laughs> yes. And absolutely. trust, yeah. So trust does, does play a role in this in terms of um, I think trust and governance play a role in that um, spreading, adopting AI at scale will require that trust in terms of more sustainable development of these technologies. Touche, but <laughs> I'm going to push you harder, but uh, a lot of the adoption is opaque because the military is adopting these technologies in both the U.S. and and China and China has been active in saying we need global rules regarding the use of AI by the military, whether it's killer robots or autonomous vehicles or drones, et cetera, um, or for training purposes. 
But I, I think your point is extremely well taken. So what does that mean for productivity? But again, I would argue, although I, I don't think you can measure it, that when a government adopts a technology, it's sending a signal that that is okay. And that might encourage firms that want, you know, the government to procure for them to move in that direction. Yeah, I think, I think there is evidence that um, strong government support as a source of demand and funding in the initial stages of a technology's incubation is very important. So um, we've seen that play out in the US where military spending provided this sort of like um, anchor demand and anchor procurement for a lot of new technologies. Um, so I think if you're, I think that there, there, there is that sort of signaling effect. Um, I think there are other examples though of technologies where government demand didn't really play that much of a role. So the history of electricity development, AI is seen as the new electricity. It's the, the government did not play much of a role in, in the development of the electrification of different manufacturing industries. Um, so I think that there, there's, there's room to debate and think about that. There's also areas where government support backfires um, and leads technology investment to go on the wrong track, right? Think about Japan's fifth generation computing project. Um, that was AI back then. Um, and Japan had, the Japanese government had this very locked in vision of where computing was going that actually went against what the trend was in, in, in private industry. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't necessarily see Chinese government investment in AI as being um, really that significant, um, uh, playing that significant a role in encouraging uh, the diffusion of AI at scale. Thank you so much for that point. I want to reiterate that if you put your questions in the Q&A, we're going to start to answer them. Um, uh, and I'm just going to ask one more before we get going with that. Um, so uh, you've probably read that the Communist Party at their meeting, they've proposed a new data governance body. It will be the world's first, I want to reiterate this to everybody, first uh, multifunctional data governance body, not just concerned with uh, use of personal data, but collective data. Um, and um, it will have administrative and monitoring and regulatory authority. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think this new data regulatory authority uh, is significant in that it's trying to manage a bunch of existing data governance uh, regulations and responsibilities that are housed in different bureaucracies. Um, so Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, Cyberspace Administration of China, CAC, those are bodies right now that are tasked with managing um, existing data security laws and rules. Um, you can even put in like personal information protection in that. that that's, that's a growing area of privacy law and regulation in China that this new data regulator presumably will have to manage. So I think the goal is to try to um, address issues with currently the, the fragmented regulatory landscape in China. Um, I think it's still an open question um, how this regulator will function. And then obviously, the, the I think one of the main questions right now is um, this trend we see towards data localization in different countries and to what extent cross-border flows of data will be maintained. Yeah, we do a lot of work on that, so we'll leave that for another time. Okay, so we're going to begin with the questions, and please keep them coming. So the first question is, Would you, where would you rank technological innovations among other indicators of national power? Uh, so, yeah, Sam, it's a good question. Uh, for me, the science and technology component is becoming an increasingly central uh, factor in national power. So I, I come from political science, international relations field. One of our rough proxies of national power that has been used in a lot of studies is the SYNC score capability. Um, CINC is the acronym. 
and it didn't it, it doesn't have a technology component um i think at one point there's i think it has a component for like industrial power which is like iron and steel output which is <laughs> doesn't really speak to sort of the new wellsprings of technological power um so to your point, Sam, there there is, I think now there's a lot of calls to put science and technology more central into those measurements of national power. Uh, for me, innovation, kind of the technological innovation part of that is important. Um, but I don't think, I think there are some instances where uh, countries are very strong in technology, uh, in the innovation capacity side, but much weaker on the diffusion capacity side. And so that's the the tension that I'm uh, that I'm trying to look at with what what I presented today. Thank you. Okay, the next question is uh, from a noted uh, scholar, actually, of uh, law and AI. He wrote a fabulous book. That's Thomas Strines. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about the interplay with AI standard setting. Sorry for um, breaching your privacy here. Do your findings with regards to China's diffusion deficit also suggest we shouldn't overestimate China's standard setting power in this domain? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, there's a lot of attention on China's efforts to become a leader in uh, standard setting and AI represents sort of like this new technology that they want to achieve like more discourse power in uh, kind of there's this feeling that China was not able to set the rules of the roads for internet technologies. Um, and they, they don't want that to be repeated in the AI space. Uh, I don't know if my stuff on diffusion deficit really applies here, but I can say a few words about standard setting. I think um, more of concerns about China's growing influence in standard setting forums, I think those are more salient for bodies like the ITU, International Telecommunications Union, um, than bodies like the ISO and IEC, um, which are the private uh, regulatory forums. And um, I think in those forums, it's still more likely that the best technology is going to win out um, rather than sort of undue influence from government actors. Uh, and there's been, I think the person that's done the best work on this is Justin Barron at Northwestern University. He has like a working paper out where he looks at a lot of data on Chinese participation in standard setting forums. Uh, and I think what he finds is the their influence is still pretty low with one exception, which is Huawei. Um, as a participant in some of these standard setting forums. And actually what Huawei has done is just hired standards development uh, experts from other countries to represent them in these forums. Um, so actually the international experts that Huawei is hiring, according to Barron, they're going to kind of continue to maintain the norms and the existing practices of standard setting organizations where kind of at the end of the day, best technology wins out. Um, so even the Chinese firm that has kind of maybe gotten the most undue influence in standard setting forms, they still have to, they might, that might be an argument that they still have to play by the existing rules of organizations like the ISO and the IEC. Um, I think there's been a lot of good research that maybe things are playing out differently in the ITU. Um, and uh, maybe the ITU has more influence in developing countries. Um, so that that's definitely something to explore further. That's very interesting. Could you put uh, Mr. Barron's name in the chat in case anybody would like to follow up on that paper? Okay, well, you do that and thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on US-China cooperation in constraining dangerous applications of AI? Are they cooperating in your mind? You could send it to us and we'll put it on the link later to make your life easier. So the yeah, question I'll is- send, I'll send that link to that paper later. Um, and while we have you, if you don't mind sending your PowerPoint, cause I know people are gonna ask. And while we will have a video of this event on our yep. YouTube site, believe me, we're gonna get requests to this PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay, yep. so the question was, what are your thoughts on US-China cooperation and constraining dangerous applications of AI? Yeah, Kevin, that's a great question. I think the the way I've been thinking about this is I have a, a 
working paper right now on the history of um, U.S. sharing of permissive action link technology. Uh, and these are uh, nuclear safety and security technologies. So technologies that guard against the accidental or unauthorized launch of nuclear weapons. Uh, so permissive action links specifically were like electronic locks and code management systems um, that the U.S. put on their weapon systems and also encouraged other countries to uh, adopt these nuclear security and safety technologies. And actually, even at the height of Cold War competition between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the U.S. shared information on permissive action link technologies with the Soviet Union. Uh, the idea is that an inadvertent or unauthorized launch anywhere threatens safety and security everywhere. Uh, so I think there is logic for a, applying that to um, AI as well. Uh, the US decision makers and policymakers have floated around ideas of like, what, what are the permissive action links for AI? Um, and I think um, there, I think the analogs would be things like safe, AI safety and security techniques. So techniques that um, allow us to mitigate or prevent accidental uses of AI systems. Um, so uh, maybe like audit trails, techniques to have audit trails for how different um, autonomous systems broke or performed um, in unsafe and hazardous ways. Uh, so I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunities for US and Chinese uh, industry, um, labs, uh, government policymakers to exchange ideas related to AI safety and security techniques. And there is a historical precedent where um, U.S. scientists um, at nuclear labs continued to maintain dialogues on nuclear safety and security with their Soviet Union counterparts. And I think those continued techn technical exchanges were essential to, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, safely and securely transporting nuclear weapons from former Soviet republics to Russia. Um, and those same technical ties, that, that trust that had been built uh, was essential in the post um, Cold War era um, in terms of maintaining nuclear safety and security. So it's a great question. Let's continue with, so then he then asks, if you were USAI cooperation czar, what policy would you pursue? It's always a dangerous thing to ask, ask an academic about <laughs> policy and solutions to the problems we identify. But I, I would say, for me, encourage um, AI labs like OpenAI, um, DeepMind to start thinking about industry norms about AI safety and security and discuss those norms with uh, Chinese labs and kind of build those uh, build those ties between researchers um, at different labs. And then I think the US government is doing, is, is thinking about things like permissive action links for AI, right? That, that specific reference is mentioned in the National Security Commission on AI's final report. Uh, Jason Matheny, uh, who had like three different positions in the White House at one point on science, technology, and national security has talked about permissive action links for AI um, in different forms. So, so I think there, there are those ideas out there um, and uh, it's about uh, implementing them um, whether that's through track two dialogues or track 1.5 dialogues, I don't know as much about what the policy architecture space looks like for those things. Um, but hopefully there, um, those will be, uh, hopefully there is action on those points. Well, um, can I take Kevin's question and sort of reframe it? Do you see a sense that the United States is moving internationally? So not just domestically with the NIST risk management framework, which you know provides a framework for firms and governmental and other entities using AI to map, measure, manage, and govern their risks. So if we were to take that further internationally, I mean, the United States is working with the EU. Do you see the United States and would you encourage the United States as an academic to move towards focusing on risk management versus a trust focus? I think you can do both at the same time. And I think that that goes back, the NIST stuff goes back to um, Thomas's question about standard setting forms. I think a lot of the dialogue and communications around risk management about AI technologies will happen in those standard setting forms. And those 
Um, I think that's a place where a lot of Chinese participants, U.S. participants can can share ideas. Um, uh, and so those could be productive forms for some of these uh, dialogues on AI safety and security that I've been talking about. Thank you. Okay, keep those questions coming. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. So Thomas just posted the link to that paper I mentioned. Um, oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. I, I hope everybody can see it. Um, so uh, the next question I ask if you've thought about China's 2017 AIDP, do you think China achieved its goals and could it fulfill its goal to become the world leader in 2030? Yeah, the, the AIDP's goals were um, centered around gross output in AI core industries and AI related industries. I think both of the like the gross output and uh, AI, the division between AI core, AI related, all those are so fuzzy that you could find a way to measure it to meet those goals. Um, and I think there were some measures that even China's industry industry was already meet, meeting those 2025, 2030 benchmarks before uh, the plan. Um, so I'm not that in, I'm not that interested in whether they met the the specific benchmarks outlined in the AIDP. Um, so, because actually, if you think about it, the the those are sort of um, those are kind of like output goals rather than. Um, to what extent is AI being adopted um, across, uh, adopted and used across many, many, many different industries and businesses? Um, and we don't have good data on that. So the U.S. has, U.S. Census did a survey on businesses as part of one module um, in 2018, I think, about adoption of machine learning techniques or how many businesses had tested or trialed those techniques. It's very, very low. Um, like maybe only 3% of businesses surveyed had tested, trialed, or planning to implement machine learning techniques. Um, and I think that's partly because uh, we hear about all these big models in the news, but to actually adopt them in a business, like in a commercial sense, um, is very hard to do. And with the general purpose technologies, economists have found it oftentimes there's an extended lag between the initial inception of these new technological paradigms and kind of widespread adoption across the economy. Um, in terms of uh, Gao's question, do you think we may see a diffusion of China's AI regulatory model to other countries? Um, this is a good question. I'll point you to uh, Matt Sheehan and Matt O'Shaughnessy for Carnegie uh, recently published a thing about the uh, China's regulatory model for AI and the EU's model for AI. Um, and so that, that might have some, they kind of make a distinction between vertical and horizontal approaches to regulating AI, whether, um, whether you regulate kind of um, the, the AI industry itself and sort of AI models as a whole, or whether you regulate them through specific industries. Um, and so I think that might be a good way to think about that question. Um, but yeah, I just don't even know if regulatory models for AI are really even fully fleshed out, or there's even a good way of thinking about China's regulatory approach to AI versus the US's regulatory approach to AI. Um, if anything, on a lot of things, the US and China seem closer together than the e, than either of them to the EU, in part because both the US and China have the big AI giants and the big tech giants. So they want a more permissive regulatory environment for those companies. EU has no AI giants or tech giants. It makes sense that they're more, there's not that many costs to regulation for them. Um, so that's why I think in part, you're seeing more of the regulations come out of the EU side. That's very interesting. Um, can I press you a little bit further on that, though? Um, in a sense, you know, I and others have argued that the U.S. is captured by its data behemoths, but it seems like China is um, undermining its data behemoths. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think one difference to your point, 
one difference between China and the U.S. is China is more concerned than the U.S. that its data behemoths, its big tech companies, um, can challenge the legitimacy of the party and the party's authority. So I think they're concerned about some of these companies getting too powerful, some of the leaders of these companies getting very popular and um, ha having a lot of personal influence. Those concerns aren't that present in the US and are not as salient in the US. So I do think that's one distinction to draw out. Um, but I mean, I think the what's consistent is both perceive themselves as dependent on these big tech giants to drive the economy going forward. So yes, you've had some crackdown on the China side, but I think in recent months, you've seen again, um, to prioritize economic growth, right? Going back to this productivity growth theme I've been talking about, to maintain performance legitimacy, the government, I think ultimately will continue to, to go back towards like a more relaxed approach to, to regulating these tech companies. Thank you so much. Okay, our next question. How would you characterize China's thinking around AGI? And uh, does the Chinese government see it as plausible or worthwhile? Yeah, so AGI, artificial general intelligence, uh, I think it's hard to summarize an entire country's thinking about it. I would <laughs> say that like the mainstream view is similar to the mainstream view in the US in that it's kind of too far away to really put that much thought into it. Uh, I think there, it, there are, I've so I translate Chinese writings on AI related topics for my weekly China AI newsletter. And so I've translated some scholars who have said we shouldn't touch AGI at all. So one of China's leading scholars on AI who leads a very strong lab at Nanjing University, Zhou Zhihua has published um, articles in the China Computer Federation Forum that says uh, we shouldn't touch strong AI at all. And we shouldn't pursue this research direction. Um, so there's a few data points on that. I mean, to the extent that you consider foundational models like large language models as building blocks to AGI, obviously a lot of Chinese labs and institutions are pursuing that line of research, just like uh, OpenAI, DeepMind, and all these other uh, Western companies. In terms of the government thinking, I haven't seen government thinking, uh, I haven't seen kind of evidence that the government really prioritizes as AGI development at all. Um, so uh, I think this goes back to, uh, again, the, the focus on AI as a driver of productivity growth, maybe coming more through this general purpose technology model, uh, slow, diffuse, incremental spread of specific AI applications across a bunch of different industries, um, rather than one day DeepMind opens up a box and we get AGI, right? Um, so the, uh, there, I think I, I haven't seen much prioritization at all from the Chinese government on AGI. Thank you. Okay, so um, another, another questioner asked, um, what role does data play in and the diffusion of widespread computing power in the difference in AI capacity between the US and China? So how important do you think data economies of scale and scope of data are? And then how important is computing power? I think data, computing power, talent, all very important drivers of AI development. Um, yeah, I think the, I think oftentimes the, I think, let me just take data and sort of, if we apply this framework I presented, we can think about the data driver in a different way, right? So oftentimes the data argument is China is the Saudi Arabia of data. So many people, so many mobile uh, internet users. So they just have so much data to drive AI development. Um, but I think the, I think oftentimes that's sort of we're thinking about like the data to train the initial model, right? And I think there's actually arguments that the data to train the initial model, China kind of faces some issues with that too. So if you look at large language models like ChatGPT, 
one of the biggest issues when uh, I'm following what Chinese researchers are talking about with why China hasn't been able to produce something like ChatGPT or at least something as powerful as ChatGPT is limitations of the amount of Chinese language, high quality Chinese language data out there, right? If you think about ChatGPT, it's mostly almost all trained on English language data. There's a lot of high quality English language data out there, not just produced by the US. Right? It's the English speaking world, a lot of high quality academic articles are in English. Uh, the scale of Wikipedia is just larger than the scale of Baidu Baike, which is the Chinese language equivalent. Um, so um, actually China, the, sort of the data even to train the initial large model China um, uh, faces some issues on that front. Um, does, did, if, if that is so, does that partially explain why China has encouraged AI firms to adopt open source models? Um, I think the, it's it's not that relevant in terms of open okay. source. Um, it's just more about, you know, these large language models are essentially trying to train on the entire text available on the internet. Um, and there's just less China, high quality Chinese language text available on the internet um, than English language text. Uh, but I, th I'm, I think my main point is, uh, if you think about diffusion capacity, maybe it's more about, do you have the data, um, do you have the data that's necessary to fine tune an already trained large model? Do you have the data that's necessary for a specific application scenario and to fine tune that data on a specific application scenario? Um, so for that, I mean, I'm speculating here, but one way to try to calculate that would be, okay, what's what's the overall digitiz digitization rate of your economy? That might make it easier for you to collect that specific data to fine tune application scenarios. Uh, what's the rate of sensor penetration across your entire economy? Um, and on all those points, uh, China is pretty far behind the US. Um, so um, if you look at it from a framework of the data sets that are necessary to fine tune the pre-trained AI models to specific commercial applications, um, I would say my point still holds. Um, so uh, that'd, be my, that'd be my take on the data question. Thank you so much. Next question. Um, both Chinese and U.S. companies are frantically trying to incorporate chat GPT, chatbots, similar chatbots into everything. How is the Chinese approach going to differ from the U.S. approach? Uh, so I think the sensitivities to uh, the sensitivities to kind of uh, pol politically incorrect uh, outputs are going to be much higher for the Chinese side. So we've seen this with uh, Microsoft, actually. Microsoft Research Asia had a Xiao Ice, Xiao Bing chatbot that's very popular in China. And I believe it was taken down maybe just temporarily, but because it like, it responded to a question one of the response, one of its responses to a question was, "You should move to the U.S. and um, leave China or something." So, the, the, <laughs> I think the kind of the need to control and censor outputs from chatbots might be much higher in China. Um, so, I think that will be uh, one of the main differences. Um, I think okay. What's oh, sorry. Um, what's important, I'll just note one more thing is the precursor to ChatGPT was GPT-3. Um, and there are versions of, and there are Chinese versions of GPT-3 out there. Um, it's just, they haven't been, like ChatGPT, one of the things that was so remarkable about that is just allowed anybody to play around with it, right? So OpenAI ate a lot of computing costs to kind of just keep that model running to be able to spit out prompts for whoever wanted to um, access it and play around with it. Uh, we haven't seen that in China, but there are Chinese versions of GPT-3 that are available to the public. Uh, you just have to go through an API system to use it. Um, so um, yeah, that that should bear on your question as well. Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, research by Chinese universities is not purely industrial, but many conduct industrial research. How do you account for this 
these universities that have overlapping responsibilities. In the US, it would be done by industry. Yeah, I think this is a good this is a good counterpoint to my argument, Kevin. I think you are right that if there's a different division of labor of research between industry and academia in China, that might account for some of the um, lack of co-authorship. Um, my response to that would be, I also cite sort of uh, Xinhua News when they list like the top five roadblocks to AI development in China, one of the top five they list is the lack of technical exchanges between industry and research. So maybe the indicator is not perfect, but I, I do think the overall story that I'm trying to tell is pretty accurate in that there is that um, lack of exchange of ideas between people implementing new advances and the people pioneering new advances. Um, and yes, the division of labor might be different for that in China versus the US, but I think just the quality um, of the communication channels, uh, the strength and the robustness of those communication channels is, is, a, is a challenge that the government itself has identified as, as one of the top challenges. Okay. Um, so um, we have this question, which I'm now struggling to read. Um, being the first, it's a lecture. So. Anonymous asks, being the first in innovation allows you to spread and sell your AI. So you get market share and build AI alliances. Since we're running a marathon and not a sprint, doesn't isn't the innovation side more important? So why is your model a better model? Yeah, I think the, to the, to Anonymous's point, being being the I think I should emphasize this: being the first to innovate and pioneer new innovations in AI will probably is probably a lot of times correlated with um and it's probably an advantage towards then being the first to intense intensively adopt ai at scale i think there are some advantages to being the first mover um but at the same i think what i'm just trying to emphasize is there are a lot of factors that other factors that affect diffusion capacity such that um, it's that that correlation um, is not determinative that, that it, it, in so in other words, there are sometimes that being the first does not result in being the best at uh, adopting um, that innovation at scale. Um, the, the VHS versus beta argument that you remember that. OK. Um, yeah. Do you think what China is is currently doing? I don't get this question. Do you think what China is currently doing on the track, is it on the track to improve diffusion? Yeah, I think it's an important question in terms of what do the trend lines show, right? Because I'm kind of taking a more snapshot view uh, of what's happening right now. I think China is definitely trying to make investments to improve um, its education institutions, to build up a broader talent base in AI. Um, obviously, the government has identified the lack of communication channels and exchanges between academia and industry as an issue and trying to correct those uh, issues. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, is going to be hard, though, is um, kind of the uh, one, uh, I think, one of the factors that allows for these fast acting diffusion processes is just um, a free market and sort of um, not having too much centrally central planning and sort of party control over the direction of technology development. Uh, in one of my cases in the diffusion deficit paper, I look at the Soviet Union, which was producing the most STEM PhD students uh, was contributing some of the novel breakthroughs in computing, but they didn't have the fast acting processes that translated those frontier advances throughout the entire economy, in part because it was centrally planned. Uh, so I think that's the big question for China is to what extent we're seeing a return to more like party controlled, centrally planned approach to technology development. And I think that is that would counter um, some of these other efforts to improve diffusion capacity. Thank you. Keep those questions coming. We have about 10 more minutes. 
Um, uh, estimates of public investment into Chinese AI enterprises vary widely. Do you have a sense as to whether China is really outspending the U.S.? I do not. I would, yeah, Sam, the 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 Georgetown CSAT report you mentioned, and then Institute of Defense Analysis also did a report a few years back on who's spending more. Um, I think my main point is just who's spending more in public R&D and AI just might not be as relevant as people think. Um, and it's not as much about the initial R&D, uh, but what happens after the R&D um, produces something. And then who can adopt and adapt it at scale? Um, I think to to Ingo's point later on in the chat, um, if the conditions there there might be something too. If the conditions of use are set elsewhere, it might strengthen the innovator's position. Um, so I, I do think there is that that goes back to our earlier discussion where I do think there are advantages to obviously being a leading pioneering firm in this space and having um, a lot of the pioneering firms in your country. Um, I just think for a lot of these advanced economies, they're going to have at least one or two leading labs and institutions plugged into the AI domain. It's so broad um, that like the, the, the ideas and the new, new breakthroughs will spread. Um, the, Susan's early point about open source kind of plays into this as well. So many of these new techniques are going to be open source and available. Um, and that I think countries will have the ability to, to adapt these foundational techniques um, that may have been trained on terms of use specific to the innovating country. They'll be able to adapt it to their own country context. Um, and it's just about um, kind of the, the, the diffusion capacity to actually um, spread those ideas and, and new techniques at scale. I've seen very little research on the implications of open source versus trade secrets for uh, control of data or for AI research. And, you know, out there, anybody out there, please do that work. Okay. Um, so here's a question relating to the difference between training data and output data, but so does TikTok give us an advantage in the diffusion race? Do it gives China an advantage? And what are your thoughts on China's colonization of the West through digital AI app? Why is that colonization? Hmm. Uh, so TikTok, I don't really think TikTok is that relevant to a lot of things I talked about with respect to innovation capacity and diffusion capacity. Um, you know, I, I think the one where I'll bring that in is a lot of people have said, I think there are some examples where China is able to scale things really quickly. Um, so the obvious one is high-speed rail, a lot of different infrastructure projects. Um, and then to, to the questioner's point, things like TikTok. So consumer-facing apps, um, mobile payment. Uh, food delivery apps. Uh, people have pointed to those as like China can scale things really quickly. But I would say that that doesn't that doesn't apply to things that are very central to the productive processes of the economy. So more business facing um, technologies, cloud computing adoption rates, right? Um, usage rates of industrial software that automates different business logistics functions. Uh, the sensors data that I talked about earlier, uh, even diffusion rates of like industrial robots um, lower than in uh, many other advanced manufacturing countries. Um, so I think my focus is more on the, the economic processes that are directly tied to productivity um, rather than more, maybe like more consumer facing apps like TikTok. Okay, this is a fascinating question from a brilliant economist. If your interest lies more in the productivity effects of, of AI diffusion, what's your thought on the scope of the AI innovators to direct and influence downstream diffusion? He cites the example, most UK companies have adopted at least one AI technique, but the conditions of use are set elsewhere. Doesn't that strengthen the innovator's position? Yeah, yeah, I, I we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, and I, I do agree that it does 
strengthen the innovator's position. Um, I just, I, I, I think that there are also many cases where, um, and, and a lot of empirical research that is that that has found um, a lot of times latecomers have an advantage, and actually um, the companies that are not the ones pioneering the technique actually adopt the technique faster. Um, so I think in the broader scale of like global international competition that I'm talking about, um, specifically the U.S. and China, um, China, no one country is going to be is going to have all the new innovations in the space, right? AI is such a broad field. Uh, it's not like one country was the innovator in all new electrical innovations. Um, like Britain was not behind in terms of the inventive genius in new electrical applications at the time. Uh, but they were behind in terms of the diffusion of electricity at scale. Um, so I think there are a lot of examples where that relationship between being the lead innovator and the lead diffuser is not determinative. And that's all I'm trying to fill in um, on that. Yeah. Um, Jeff, could you stay for five more minutes? Um, because we do have a couple of questions and- Sure. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Um, how have chat GPT uh, affected that dynamic of competition between the US and China? Um, you know, I think it's a good question. Um, I think the, the thing that I've noticed is, um, I think it's, it doesn't shape the overall, will we compete or will we cooperate? relationship, I think it does shape um, the emphasis of that competition. So in China, there, in recent years, there's been actually a trend where different tech companies have shut down their independent AI research labs. So Alibaba actually has scaled back its like kind of foundational AI research. The Demo Ac Academies, its big AI research labs around the world, have like narrower like performance and commercial targets, key performance indicators they have to meet. It's very different from the open AI and deep mind model. Um, and since in chat GPT and all the hype around that, there's been discussions in, in Chinese science and technology circles uh, saying, hey, we need to go back to this foundational lab model and kind of have independent AI research institutes um, and sort of follow the open AI model on that front. So there, there has been talk uh, on that front. Great. Um, okay. And then what are your thoughts on Kai Fu Li's hypothesis that China can just steal IP and use their authoritarian political authority to gain a diffusion advantage? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, in terms of Kai Fu Li's points, I benefit greatly from his AI superpowers book in terms of the emphasis on diffusion capacity. I just disagree with his point that China is ahead of the US in terms of diffusion capacity. Um, I don't really know. A lot of people ask about IP theft in this area. I can't really think of like the kind of um, I, IP theft in AI just doesn't seem as relevant uh, in that a lot of these foundational models are open source. Uh, so it's more about how can you get more people to use your foundational models and build specialized algorithms off of them. Um, so uh, to me, IP theft uh, does not really matter that much. And sort of the other factors that I mentioned about um, contributing to diffusion capacity, like human capital, uh, tech transfer linkages, stuff like that is infinitely more important. The only thing is, um, and again, I don't know, but I do, There, I have not seen any good study, but even with open source, let's say algorithms, if the data is protected under trade secrets, um, you know, I, this intersection of trade secrets and open source is not re well researched. We don't know what's going on and how they intersect. And one big confusion that I have is how firms, and, and, and we're going to do a webinar on this. There's a scholar, Dan Gervais at Vanderbilt Law School, who's done quite a bit of work on this who says that, you know, under trade circuits, firms can always reuse the data. 
but what both the training data, unless it's restricted under contract, and the output data. What's your thoughts? I I would I don't know the spe the legal specifics of that. So um, yeah, maybe that can be topic for a future webinar. I'll just say that like still I, I just like because the data that's most relevant, at least what I consider most relevant, is the the specific data that's used to fine tune an algorithm. Uh, a Chinese firm that's just stealing something from a U.S. firm would still need to come up with its application specific data for it to actually make any money or be right so that's that's why i i don't i i just really don't think about ip theft that much well not so much ip theft but i think the issue is control over the reuse of data like um you know it sort of relates to the argument many people make about google which says it's uh, mission is to organize the world's data i think they say information and because of trade secrets they get ever more control over the reuse of data, whether that data is personal data, satellite data, whatever. Yeah, no, I, I think that that could be that's an interesting line of thinking. Um, I haven't I just haven't thought as much about it to really come up with anything that that would be insightful. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. That's why I asked because I haven't seen anything. Okay, the final question. Does the Chinese government and Chinese tech writers discuss China's tech diffusing capacity problems? And if they do, what is the Chinese term that they use? Good question, Ben. Um, so I haven't seen like, like a Chinese term for diffusion capacity. Um, mostly in part because this is like a term that I'm trying to come up with as like a new concept. Um, so I think I think they would kind of the, the the articles that I've translated more trying to talk about like adoption rates um, and just like uh, digitalization is another thing. So some of this research comes off of translations of like, organizations like Alibaba Research Institute that are tracking like digitalization rates across different industries and sort of measuring the spread of the digital economy in China. So so those two uh, might be starting points for for more like Chinese language sources in this area. Okay. Jeffrey Ding, uh, thank you so much for your insights into China's AI. And thank you everybody for joining us today and please get in touch if you have any further questions and we'll put that forward to Jeffrey Ding. Have a great day, everybody, and look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, which will probably be on AI and AP. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, no, uh, we have some other ones, but I'll let you know. All right. Thank you all. Have a good one.